This is our third in our 2019 series of water talks. Um, the Academic Field Watersheds Alliance works around the communities in Wakefield and Atkins to protect clean water from the lakes and ponds we have here. And one of the ways we do that is to get people excited about all the things that go on in the water. So today we have Don Freshburn from DK Water Consultants. Water That's close enough. Um, and Don's going to tell us about the that we have here. So this is, well thanks, thanks, you know, for, for showing up on a day that is really nice and bright things in the sky and, <laughs> and uh, not going fishing today so you can come here and talk about fish, which is, you know, it's crazy right now. Thanks for coming out. Um, how many of you were here last year when I, or, or were at the, uh, I guess it's not going, but I talked about water quality. <laughs> So I'm only going to have like two, I think, slides that are repeats from that. But one, I mentioned fish when I, when I was talking about water quality in the Atkins Wakefield Lakes and fish in general, and I think that sparked some interest. Um, and I said, you know, that's another talk, and it's actually probably another 10 talks, but condensed it all down into one, and I'm going to try to make it about an hour or so, um, and leave time for questions. There is one spot towards the end where we'll kind of have a decision point I got a couple of examples from outside of this area that are kind of neat fish stories, but if you don't have time and you want to you answer questions, that's all fine. I can stay as long as it is as need be, so that's not a big deal about that. We'll kind of play that by ear. Uh, I've been working in, in New Hampshire since 1986 uh, on lakes. Um, the last five years I've been working for myself. Um, I live in Wolfboro, just down the road here. It's kind of nice to come to a uh, kind of a local talk, and I had to travel very far. I was sitting at my desk half an hour ago, and now I'm here, and uh, um, that's kind of nice. And it's been really nice to work on some of the, the Atkin Wakefield Lakes with Linda uh, in the last few years, um, um, just because they're so close, and they're, they're, uh, it's, it's really interesting for me to work on things in my neighborhood. Um, so anyway, with, with that, um, I'll start um, and talk about how fish fit in our lakes. Uh, and if you, you know, the way we relate to fish and lakes has kind of changed over the years, and I'll try to identify most of the pictures that they have. Um, you know, this is kind of a typical uh, uh, picture of how we, how we deal with fish and lakes now. This is a rainbow trout caught over on uh, uh, Lower Beach Pond in Tuffington by a friend of mine. And these are just a couple of my dad's friends when he was a kid, and, you know, that fish went back in the water. You know, these all went home. And, uh, we kind of do things a little differently now. I mean, the fish that we have available to us are a little different now. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as, as we go forward here. So I'm going to talk about how water quality affects fish. Um, water quality is you know, central to the mission of AWWA. Um, it's central to a lot of what I do. But it also affects more than just your perceptions of what the lake looks like. It, it, it affects what lives there. Um, then, how fish might affect water quality, and that's not something we often think of. Um, I'll talk a little bit about habitat and fish in, in, in lakes. Um, I have a few slides on the fish that you know, the information I was able to glean on the fish in uh, the WWA lakes. Um, I have three fish stories, that's the optional part, and then, uh, and then kind of what's next. Um, So lake biology, there's an awful lot beyond water quality that we have in lakes. You know, there's everything from small fish to algae to crayfish on the bottom to zooplankton that are up in the water columns swimming around, aquatic plants, mammals, and bigger fish. I mean, all these things are in our lake. You know, you don't necessarily see that when you drive by, but um, they all are there and they all have a role to play. And if you took it in its most simple form, <laughs> Now this is kind of the food chain in most lakes. You've got big fish, in this case it's a largemouth bass, it might be a trout in, in, in some lakes, it might be a pickerel in others. They eat these small fish. The small fish eat the zooplankton, which are swimming around, the little, the little swimmies when you take a handful of water and you see something swimming around. Those are the zooplankton. Those zooplankton eat the algae, which is the green stuff. And we measure the green stuff as part of our water quality, and we call it chlorophyll A, is the measure of how green the lake is. And the green stuff's eaten by, by the zooplankton, and the green stuff tells us how clear our water is, 
And the green stuff is also a function of how many nutrients we put in it. So the same stuff that makes your long green would make the late green. The same set of nutrients. So it's all connected. So does water quality affect the fish? So this is one of the, oh, yes it does in a few ways. Sorry. <laughs> this is one of the slides of repeat from last year. These are the AWWA lakes, and this is how much phosphorus you have. And if you look at the panel behind it, it's sort of how green the lakes are. And that's a really relative term. But you know, some of them are greener than others. Um, some of them are in the blue state, you know, which means they're fairly clear, there's not a lot of algae growth. A lot of that is due to nutrients. And I don't want to downplay the effect of nutrients. There are very few scenarios and very few lakes where more phosphorus would make the lakes better from, from our seven values. Um, and uh, so I don't want to downplay that, but there's other things going on for sure, and, and the fish is part of that. So if we take that sort of measure of greenness, and I don't have too many graphs, there's a couple. I, I dumped some of them out this morning when I was going through this. Um, so this is kind of on this axis is how clear the lake is, and this is how green the lake is. And this is how many fish, game fish, you, you can expect to grow in that lake. And as you can see, you know, in a really clear lake with not much, not much for nutrients, you can't grow a huge number of fish. I mean, you can't have a pristine swimming pool with no nutrients and nothing growing in it, and expect fish to, to grow and thrive. But they have to have something to eat. There has to be, you know, a minimum amount. So as you add more green stuff, you get more and more fish up to a point, and then it drops off really quickly. And once you get into this sort of very green state, a lot of things happen with water quality that aren't great for fish. Um, you get too much oxygen, the visibility isn't good. A lot of the predators need to see things to be able to eat them. And if they can't see them, they can't eat, they don't do well. Um, a lot of that productivity ends up using up oxygen, especially in the lower parts of the lake. So a lot of that greenness, when that greenness dies, it's just like something sealed up in your refrigerator. Um, it starts to use oxygen and, it's, and, and uh, that turns out to be not great for fish. Fish need oxygen. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, how might that work? So, right now, um, I was just out on Lake Quinn uh, two days ago with my wife, and uh, the lake is all one time. It's all lakes, top to bottom, and most of the lakes around here are in that state right now. And in fact, because it's windy today, I'm sure the lakes are just rolling over. It's the same temperature, top to bottom. And you see it happens right after I saw it. So, shortly after that, we get a couple of warm sunny days. You know, we're going to have another one tomorrow, and then we're not going to have one for a little bit. Um, and the surface water starts to warm up. And so when, when that warms up, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if any of, you, any of you have gone swimming as early as Memorial Day, but you'll often be, you know, swimming at the surface, like, wow, this is really warm. And then you realize your feet are down in this cold water. It's like, whoa, oh, that's really cold down there. And that only lasts for a few weeks. Eventually, the warm water gets deep enough that you can't feel the cold water. It doesn't mean the cold water is not still there. It's still down there. It's just at the bottom of the lake. And this cold water turns out to be critical for a lot of fish species, but it's also critical in terms of oxygen. And cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. You know, so it's, it's starting off with quite a bit of oxygen, but if you have too much green stuff up here, as that green stuff dies, it goes down into the bottom. Because they're different temperatures, it doesn't, this water never mixes up to the surface until the fall. So there's no new oxygen coming in from wave action, from you know, the atmosphere. So that oxygen, this oxygen starts to drop. And if it gets too low, the fish can't live down there anymore. And that turns out to be a really bad thing for them. Because a lot of those fish need cold water. They get forced up into warmer water and don't do so well. So there's five issues for fish with temperature and dissolved oxygen. Um, as I just said, increased algal growth can lead to decreased oxygen in the deep waters of the lake. Fish and other aquatic life need dissolved oxygen to survive. If there's not enough oxygen, you're not going to find fish. Bugs aren't going to do well, um, and uh, you're going to have a much, much more uh, less diverse lake. Some fish prefer cold water. 
A lot of the trout species, sometimes the young of certain fish species, need to go down deep, not so much for the cold water, but because it's dark down there, and they don't get eaten. If they come up near the surface, they get eaten. Cold water holds them a lot more oxygen than warm, and fish force upward, maybe in warmer water than preferred, or more vulnerable to predation. It means that they get forced up, they get eaten, or, they, or their metabolism basically burns them out if they're not adapted to that kind of warm, warm water environment. Like a trout that's in water that's too warm, and they can't eat enough to keep their metabolism from consuming their body, essentially. So these are a couple of shots from uh, the AWWA lakes. And if we use, these are the, some of the deep water sites. And this is, this is the kind of the line to keep, pay attention to. So this is five, five milligrams per liter of oxygen is right here. This is as you go deeper and deeper into a lake, how much oxygen you have. And five is kind of the, the minimum number for, for a lot of fish species. They can go down to low five for short periods of time, but they won't stay there for long. Um, and obviously below four, three, two, they can't survive at all. So if you look here, you know, Wilson Lake, um, Mullen Lake, both of them, for times during the year, that whole deep section of the lake doesn't have enough oxygen for fish. And same thing here in Lovell Lake. Great East Lake, at least so far, you know, the lowest, we, the lowest that we've seen is, um, is six. So you can have fish that are down in the deep parts of the lake. And that really dictates what kinds of fish you might want have in the lake and what kinds you, you, know, you might want to put in a lake. So what we call this is the temperature oxygen squeeze. So if you look, if a fish want, needs to be, these lines here are the, um, are the dissolved oxygen lines, okay? And these are the temperature lines. So the fish wants to be in places that have dissolved oxygen greater than five milligrams per liter. So that's above this line. They want to be there at that depth. So that's from 13 feet to the surface. But they also want to be in temperatures that are colder than 12 degrees Celsius. So that's below that line. So there's no place where they can have both of those things. And that's a problem for them. You know, and this is for a period, these are months down here, so this is basically from middle of July through sort of the end of September. There's no place where they can have all of their needs met, and that's a problem for fish. And, you know, we call that squeeze. This is not from a particular lake, um, although you can do such an analysis, and I, I would guess that some of those that, that, that it actually goes down, um, they would look very similar to this, like Lovell Lake, and um, they would look very similar to this, this kind of curve. But this is just a generalized idea that there are times when a fish has no place to go. So other potential water quality issues related to fish. Um, there's a whole host of them. This is like this is the, the other eight talks that I, I could perhaps give on fish. Somebody else here. But, you know, we have toxic issues, chloride, road salt issues, um, pH, mercury, microplastics. That's there's a lot of the, in, uh, it's been in the news a lot. Um, it turns out the microplastics are everywhere, including in the middle of the ocean. Um, these are, you know, pieces of plastic that were a piece were a plastic, quote unquote, biodegrades, but it actually just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and those small pieces are still around. They get in the food chain. So plankton eat them, fish eat them, and they're in the fish, and ultimately that comes back to us. Um, endocrine, endocrine disruptors. There's a lot of things. That we, we have you know, hair products, um, soaps, um, perfumes. There's a lot of things in our everyday life that mimic hormones, and those can cause profound effects on the aquatic system. Uh, pesticides and herbicides is another one. Um, a couple of studies, um, and I, I like to, to push these studies just because both times when I read these studies, both of these studies, um, they were kind of a, a bit of a shock to me. Um, this study by, by Stan Dodson in Wisconsin, basically what he found out that ponds that had more than 30% lawn cover, this is residential lawn cover, this isn't anything special, in their watershed, had 
had very few zooplankton, no plants, um, no snails, and no amphibians. I mean, they were biological deserts. And he speculated that, you know, and that some of the other ponds that he, that he, he looked at had agriculture in the watershed, they had parking lots, they had industrial facilities. Um, none of those predicted whether or not there would be life or not. The thing that predicted how much whether there would be life or not was how much lawn there was. And he speculated that it was because of pesticides and herbicides that people added to their lawns. And those ended up, you know, doing a great job of making the lawns a very sterile environment with no bugs and no grubs. And when that washes off, it ended up making the, the downstream pond a very sterile environment. The other study, and this goes back to endocrine disruptors, it's a study they did up in, in Canada where they basically took wastewater, the, the concentration of estrogen or artificial estrogen that would be in a normal wastewater, coming from a normal wastewater plant. And that estrogen comes from, primarily from things like birth control pills that are, you know, they go through, through people and into the wastewater stream and not necessarily treated out. So he took the concentration that comes out of that pipe and made that the entire lake. Um, he made that concentration in the entire lake. And within a couple of years, all of the minnows in that lake became females. And a year after that, they all went extinct. Quite a shocking result. I mean, that, this was a really, really low concentration. We don't have those kinds of concentrations in our lakes. But it's, it, you know, the fact that they could make that happen on a lake-wide scale is pretty, pretty scary. I'm sure that there are, you know, other lakes where um, this effect is being, is being felt. It may be at a lesser degree, but it's something to pay attention to. That, you know, the levels that we discharge to our lakes um, can be alarming. So can the fish community affect water quality? Obviously, in your goldfish bowl, it can. Um, anyone who's had a goldfish, my daughter has one now, and uh, she knows what dirty water looks like, and you know when it's time to clean it. So back to the simple food chain, um, everyone is someone else's lunch, this is a little different one, and then we have rainbow trout and smell, and then we have the zooplankton, and phytoplankton, and, and, uh, and nutrients. Um, this is probably the food chain in, in part of the previous, I think previous has rainbows, I've got a slide on that later. Um, so how does this work in real life? So the more big fish you have, this makes perfect sense, the less little fish you have, right? Because the big fish eat the little fish. So that makes sense, right? That's pretty easy to figure out, you know? And so if you don't have as many little fish, you have more zooplankton, right? Because the little fish aren't there eating. And if you have a lot of zooplankton, You don't have as much algae. And this is for the same amount of nutrients, you know, in a lake. So a lake could look very differently depending on what the, what the food chain structure looks like. It could look green or it could look blue depending on what you have for fish and whether the fish community is balanced. Historically, what we used to do is, you know, back to my first slide, we used to take all these big predators out. I mean, you catch a big one, what do you do? You bring it home. And a lot of lakes became pretty depauperate in these big fish. I mean, there just weren't that many big fish left. So as a consequence, you ended up with a lot of little fish. And the lakes were greener as a result. So how might that work? So this is again in our green, green and blue lake. So for the same amount of nutrients, if you have a lake that's dominated by pisomores or fish that eat fish, big fish, you might have this amount of algae, algal growth, which would make it a blue lake. If that same lake didn't have these guys, but had mostly minnows, small fish, it might be a green lake. Same amount of nutrients, different amounts of algae. And that's sort of the, you know, the, the theme. And one of the examples I'm talking about, um, I did some work on that when I was in grad school, and I'll share it with you if you attention. So now I'm going to talk about another aspect of the lakes, and that's habitat. You know, natural shorelines, woody debris. There's been a fair amount of research done recently on that.
So natural shorelines in development, um, you may have seen this slide before, I, I, I use it a lot. This is the same shoreline before and after development. Uh, this rock is that rock. Um, clearly, it's different in terms of habitat. And it's different in terms of shading on the water. It's different in terms of um, what the near shore environment is like. So natural shoreline, um, you know, just quick characteristics. You have vegetation to the water's edge. You have some aquatic plants. Um, it's a natural shoreline is not completely mowed down, mowed free of aquatic plants. Um, they, they're probably native plants, but they're, they're aquatic plants. They're shade, which is an important factor. You cut down all the trees at the waterfront, um, sunlight gets to that shallow water area, and plants grow, and probably plants that you don't want to grow. So the more shade you have, the less plants you're going to have in the waterfront. Um, you have natural bottom material, a mixture of rocks and gravel and mud. Um, it's not pure sand from, from, uh, for the whole shoreline. Um, natural woody debris, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, turns out that that's really, really important for fish. It um, has complexity, different environments for different times, places where you know, fish can feed, places where fish can hide, places, places where little fish can hide, places where things can grow that fish can feed on. Complexity is really important to fish. Um, and little disturbance. So no boat traffic blasting through and things like that. Um, those are all kind of characteristics of natural shoreline. Um, the developed shoreline, there's typically less young fish. There's typically fewer fish species, fewer fish nests. Um, typically, native fish species decline, and then the non-native fish species do better in disturbed shorelines. Fewer insects and larvae for fish to eat. So, you know, when in doubt, keep it as natural as, as possible. So, what is woody debris? When we're talking about woody debris, it's trees and branches that naturally fall into the lake. It's not, you know, thrown a long ways in the lake. Um, it's, you know, things that a tree falls over, it, you know, and I always say, you know, I get this question a lot, well, a tree fell in the lake, we need to get it down. It's like, well, is it, is it hazardous navigation or swimming or is it, conflicting with a use that you have immediately right there? I said, well, no. Well, then, then leave it. It's great for fish. I mean, if you look at where fishermen go, it's typically around these down trees, because that's where the fish are. So what function does woody debris have in these? Really important for bugs. A lot of the bugs live on that woody debris. And so those less woody debris means to be dragon flies, and dancing flies, and a lot, of other, a lot of other bugs. It turns out the dragonflies and dancingflies are our friends. They eat a lot of mosquitoes. They eat black flies, which are just coming out. Um, you know, they are our friends. And, they, and the fish like to eat them, so there's, there's a lot of reasons for them to be around. Um, so it means fewer beneficial bugs for fish to eat because the bugs need a place to grow. And obviously, fewer, fewer dragonflies means more black flies and mosquitoes. Fish use of what, what do you agree? I mean, where does every fisherman go? They go to the thick stuff. Um, the little guys hide in it. The big ones that cruise around try to try to um, find the little ones in it. I mean, it's, it's a really, really good place for habitat. Wildlife uses it. Um, you know, minks, kingfishers, turtles, parrots, they all use woody debris. Anglers love woody debris. Um, this is a friend of mine up on Lake Bagot. Um, he obviously thought that was a great place to fish. Look at all that weed debris. There was a lot of fish hiding underneath this stuff. Um, now these are places where people like to fish because that's where the fish are. Shoreline protection. This one's maybe not so obvious, but clearly having a log along the shoreline when there's a lot of wave action really protects the shoreline from erosion. And sort of a natural shoreline will have a mix of sand and, and woody debris. And that woody debris does a lot to protect the shoreline and break up the wave action. So the relationship between woody debris, CWD is coarse woody debris, and shoreline development. All this says is that the more the, the less shoreline development you have, the more woody debris you have. 
And this is in lakes all across Wisconsin. It's very similar here. So the more people live around a lake, the less woody debris you have. Because people take it out. Well, I got to clean up the lake. I got to get it out. So what does that really mean? So it turns out that the number of trees in the lake, you can, you can equate that to fish growth, which is crazy to think of. But, you know, the, um, David Schindler did this study uh, back in 2000. So basically, in high development lakes, the fish don't grow as well as in undeveloped lakes. So lakes with more trees in them um, have faster growing fish. Um, and that, that holds true for both the little fish, the sunfish, and the big fish. So the more trees in the lake, the faster the fish grow, the more fish you have. So should we remove woody debris if it's a safety concern? Yes. Otherwise, no. Okay. So the next piece is sort of this native, exotic, and invasive species. And I might have confused a few people last time when I was talking about you know, species that were exotic and whether that was good or bad. And a lot of that is just a value judgment. Um, and whether or not, you know, a species that's not supposed to be in a lake is good or bad. Because there's lots of examples in New Hampshire of species that are not native, but we love them. So, and that's, you know, strictly a, a, a judgment call. But I will try to, uh, try to explain a little bit more. So native species have evolved where they are, right? So, in our lakes, um, and I've got a list coming up, so I mean, I can't get them all here, but things like pickerel were native. In some lakes, lake trout were native. Yellow perch were native. Cusk were native, which is uh, bird. Um, uh, certain species of minnows, whitefish were native. Suckers. Uh, uh, pumpkin sea sunfish, native. Um, a lot of others, and most of the fish that we see commonly in our lakes are not native. So exotic species, those are species that are introduced to a place where they've not evolved to be. And they may or may not be invasive. By invasive, we mean, you know, they can cause environmental, economic, or human health harm. You know, that um, milfoil is a good example of that. You know, it's an invasive. Um, it can really take over an area. It causes economic harm. It may, may cause some ecological harm. Um, probably not a good thing. But there's a lot of non-native species, you know. This is a brown trout. <coughs> brown trout are from Europe. They're not from the United States or from North America at all. Um, yet they're in a lot of our lakes. Um, native species is the pickerel. Um, invasive species, so these are introduced to a place they haven't evolved and they cause problems. And this is a rock bass. And depending on, you know, fish and game considers that an invasive species. Um, they're on their way, and they're close. So they, 10 years ago, they ended up in Winnipesaukee, um, and within a few years, they were at, at enormous proportions to the, to the point where about one out of every five or six bass that are caught are rock bass, and not smallmouth, where they used to be all smallmouth. Um, and that's caused some, some problems. They're competing with the smallmouth. Um, they're on a march across the state, at, you know, I would love to see them not go any further. I'd be surprised if they don't, unfortunately. So non-native invasive species often cause changes to a lake ecosystem, both good and bad. They may lead to instability in the system. I mean, if, if something's evolved over the centuries to be there, and it's the right fish that's there, and this fish is that fish, everyone knows their role. But you throw one that's not supposed to be there in the mix, it can really cause havoc. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, may lead to a loss of native, native species through displacement and competition. So you know so everyone competes with somebody else. And if you get a, an invasive species that's not not or that's doing particularly well, somebody's going to lose on that because there's a limited amount of food available for everybody. So um, that's you know it's just a, a straight competition. Thing. Um, it may include species in, a, in effects that people like. Rainbow trout, brown trout, people seem to like having those in the lakes if they're native, but people tend to like those. Smallmouth bass, not a native in New Hampshire, but people tend to like them. 
Um, many good speeches and effects that people do not like. Um, rock bass is, a good, is, is an example. You know, we all saw the newspaper reports about snakehead fish, you know, coming up from Florida. They're not in New Hampshire, but they were in, in upstate New York. Um, you know, kind of an ugly looking fish, and it's like, whoa, we don't want that. Um, so, uh, they include, you know, the effects that people don't like. Um, the Asian carp, that's another good example. I don't know if you've seen pictures of boats going down the Mississippi and carp flying out of the water. That's an Asian carp that, um, that was introduced to the Mississippi uh, accidentally. And it's taken over the whole Mississippi drainage, and there's some question as to whether or not it's gotten into the Great Lakes area. It's a big controversy in Chicago um, over whether or not they should keep barriers, electric barriers, in between the Mississippi system and Lake Ontario, or Lake Michigan, rather, to keep, keep them up. Um, but there's some, some speculation that they may have already gotten by that. Um, typically, the invasive species are considered the worst of the non-natives. And, you know, certainly, milfoil is a good example that you probably all know of. Um, there are fish species like that as well. All right, so we're going to do a quick test. Test your fish abilities. Your fish, fish identification abilities. And uh, don't be embarrassed if you don't know the answers. I gave this to a high school class. There was only one kid that knew them all, and most kids didn't know any of them. All right, so what's that one? That's... Nope. That one is a yellow perch. Is that a native? Yes. Yes, it is. That is a great answer. What's that one? Yep. Which, which kind? Large one. Large one. Now what's a large one? Is that a native? No. No. Not a native. Um, and that one's, that one's a little bit more recent than a smallmouth. The smallmouth came in in the, um, about 1860. Um, and Rust Pond and Wolfboro was the first place that they, they were put in. And largemouth were shortly thereafter. So uh, they were intentionally put in. They're um, in the Great Lakes West. Where they're, they're dating. But they've been around so long, longer than any of us have been alive, that we consider them natives. Oh, yeah, this is, those are our small mouth bass. Well, they were they somebody else's purpose. Okay, this one. Probably these are in Great East Lake. They're in Winnie. That one's a lake trout. Is that a name? It is. That's a name. So that's a trout to be, you know, it would have been here in the That one. So you can't tell it's a little washed out, it's a nice pink straight here. That's a rainbow trout. Native? No. They're from west of the Mississippi, Rocky Mountains, but they're, they're stocked all over the place. That one. That's a black crack. Um, these are also on the move. Um, they showed up in Lake Wentworth about seven or eight years ago. Now they're, they're in there in great numbers and they're enormous. Um, this one is kind of a mixed bag because people actually like to catch them. And they, they taste really good. So, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely moving. They compete with somebody else, no doubt. Um, but, um, and they're in a lot of lakes already. They're probably in some of yours already. No, I to try to show this one. Pickerel. Pickerel. Is that native? Yes. Yes, it is. And the three more are four. That one is, and this is tough. That was a white fish. And it is native on some of the deeper lakes in New Hampshire. Uh, Squam, Wikisaki, maybe Ossipi. That one. Same family as the straight bass. That was a white perch. And is it native in our lakes? No, it's not. Um, it's, it's a coastal fish, actually, from the estuaries, but it's been planted in a bunch of lakes. In fact, most lakes, it seems like most lakes have any size in the, in the state. Um, it doesn't look like a white fish. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they actually, if you see them, if you catch one, they got kind of a bluish mouth to them sometimes. Um, yeah, it's probably more dry. Um, but anyway, um, not native, um, 
but they seem to be doing really well in, in a lot of ways. This one's a tough one. It's a sunfish. This one's a this one's called a bluegill. And it looks like every other sunfish, kind of, but it isn't quite, and it's not a native. Um, but they're in a lot of lakes. And I think, I suspect, this one is, is also a sunfish. This one's called a pumpkin seed, and this one is native. And I suspect that these two guys breed together a lot. So there's a lot of them. If you look at them, it's like, boy, that's really close to both of them. So there may be some crossbreeding going on there. So there's the answers, um, um, and here's a list of native and imports. Um, so you know, if you look at the ones that are, you know, the, the fish that we typically would see in a lot of our lakes, you know, rainbow trout, landlocked salmon, um, lake trout are native in some lakes, in the deep lakes, but they're not native everywhere. Smallmouth and largemouth bass, bluegill, some, I mean. This is kind of a whole population of a lot of lakes that you would typically, if you went out fishing, you wouldn't catch a native fish. You might catch the odd pickerel, you might catch a yellow perch, you might catch pumpkin seed, but beyond that, you're probably mostly catching things that aren't native. Don, how are they moving around? Is it mostly through stocking? Or? Yeah, so, so some of the original introductions for like the bass was intentional stocking. Uh, the trout is almost always stocking. You know, the, the, the state runs hatcheries and stocks. Um, you know, I will say the trout, except for some of the brown trout, they typically don't reproduce successfully themselves. So it's completely supported by stocking. If they stop stocking, chances are those, those trout will go away. Um, after a few years, they would eventually die at the age and that be it. Um, a lot of them are moving by bait pail introductions. So you have a, you buy a pail of bait and there's a rock bass amidst the shiners, and at the end of the day, you dump them over the side, and all of a sudden, you got rock bass in that lake. Some of them are intentionally done by, by fishermen or kids. You know, brought the fish home, brought it home, and mom and dad said, "Get rid of that thing." So they just whoosh, off to the nearest nearest uh, stream. You know, and a lot of it's just education to keep people from doing that. Um, but there's a certain level of that, even with the best of education, it still happens. Um, and it's unfortunate because, like I said, there can be really unintended consequences on, on a lot of that stuff. So, very few of our lakes contain only native species. Very few of the native populations haven't been influenced by outside factors. And we either fishing, development, introduction of non native species. Um, the water quality and ecological links related to fish in individual lakes is rarely considered as part of management. I mean, you know, we, we talk a lot about phosphorus and nutrients, but we rarely put the two pieces together. What lives in the lake with the nutrients and with, you know, the, 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 uh, the water chemistry. And I think we need to look at that as part of the big, bigger picture. So I'm just going to scroll really quickly through the lakes in AWWA until I'm sure. Is everyone here affiliated with an AWWA lake in one way or another or several of them? So you'll see your own, your own lake here. Yeah, so, and these are just the published reports by Fish and Game. And to my knowledge, you know, there aren't any, you know, other survey, there may be some other survey data out there. I couldn't find it publicly. Um, the state might have some more survey data. Because I know that there's more fish species than this in there. But these are the ones that Fish and Game reports publicly. Um, and of those, largemouth bass and black crappie um, are both um, not natives. Bellow Lake, the cat, they're saying catfish. I'm not, I bet that they mean bullhead, but uh, um, most of the species are not. And I'm not sure it's spotted bass. That's what it says on this particular reference. I'm not sure which species they're referring to um, because I'm not aware of a spotted bass. I mean, some, sometimes the common names are, are, are um, different than, you know, depending on where you live. I mean, some fish are called kibbies and kibbers, and, you know, there's a million different names for them, and they're all the same species. Uh, Gravy's Lake. So, lots and lots of um, non native species there. 
Um, and the state has continued to, you know, they added landlocked sand and rainbow trout. Um, in 2018, I'm sure they're going to do it again this year. Either one of those are native to the Great Greece, to my knowledge. Um, Horn pond, um, again, non native trout, um, small quadrilateral bass, white perch, bluegill, um, and a few natives. Um, the state has put in browns and rainbows. Um, Lake Ivanhoe, um, large mouth bass, brown trout, single smelt. Um, no, all, all of them are, are non natives. Um, there's no official reports of other species, though well. I'm sure there are others in there. Um, Bubble Lake, uh, right around the corner. Uh, walleye, well, that's a different one. There aren't many lakes in the state that have walleye. Connecticut River has walleye, and there may be a lake out in you know, that part of the state, like. Spofford Lake has some walleye, uh, but that, that's a rarity for New Hampshire um, to have walleye. And they look like a big perch. Uh, Pine River Pond, similar to a lot of the other smaller lakes, small mouth largemouth bass, black crappie. Province Lake, small mouth largemouth bass. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing, and I did actually need to find out a little bit more about that. Freshwater jellyfish are reported there as, a, as a, a aquatic species. I was out there several times last summer. I didn't see them. Yeah, yeah, I would love to see them. Um, yeah. That's a pretty cool thing. I've, I've but just, not native. I've seen them in, in Lake Idaho. Yeah. But not every year, just once in a while. Little, little, little jellyfish. jellyfish? Yeah. Yeah, huh? Well, well, that's something. I mean, if you see them again, I mean, that would be worth reporting to, to Amy Spagula. <laughs> Or someone like that, because that report is not out there. It's not listed. Oh, really? So no. They and they would know at UNH because I reported to them. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but Amy would keep track of the actual yeah. official yeah. listings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Wilson Lake in Maine, um, lots and lots of different uh, um, species reported there. Um, many of them are not natives, <laughs> including brown trout. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Do we have a watch? Okay. Okay. Do you want to do some fish stories? <laughs> so these are basically stories of, you know, kind of case studies of where the fisheries and water quality are intersecting. And these are ones, um, one of them that I worked on, one of them, or two of them I worked on, one of them I lived in. Um, they're, they're pretty interesting stories, I think. You know, but I'm kind of dirty and I'm inside on a Sunday, so here you go. <laughs> Take that for what's worth. Okay, so the first one. It's called Big big Title Cascading Trophic Interactions. Um, it was pure science. This is some work I did in grad school. I was part of a big team that uh, was trying to answer the question Do fish influence water quality? This was back in the 80s. We were fortunate enough to be able to work on the Notre Dame properties up on the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where they own 40 some odd lakes completely. The whole watershed, the whole everything. So there are certain lakes that they allow the researchers to do really interesting research on because we had access to the whole lake. Um, there were some lakes that they wanted to keep fishing, but uh, um, these are ones we could work on. So, we changed the fish community of two lakes, and one lake we left, left alone. We didn't do anything with it. That was a control. So this is Peter Lake. This is Paul Lake. You have a little biblical reference there. This is Notre Dame properties. And this one's Tuesday Lake, which we always thought it should have been married, but it wasn't. Um, uh, so it's Peter, Paul, and Tuesday. Um, this lake has, was dominated by minnows. There was no big fish in there at all, all minnows. This one was dominated by bass, um, and this one was dominated by bass. So, this is again the theory. We had these large mouth bass, they were eating these red belly dace <coughs> minnows, and the minnows were eating these, the zooplankton, the zooplankton are eating the algae, and the algae are fed by the nutrients. So, Peter Lake. We removed the bass through a whole bunch of means. I have some slides of that. 
and we added minnows that we took from Tuesday Lake. In Tuesday Lake, we removed all the minnows and added bass. So we just flopped the fish community. So we made this one a minnow lake and we made that one a bass lake. And said, well, what happens to the water quality we do that? And so here's a couple of pictures of how we got rid of the, moved all the fish. We had minnow tracks, we had hook and line. Um, and I remember telling my father, you know, he goes, well, what, how's your research going? Well, we had to go out and get a fish for bass. We were trying to get all the bass out of this lake. He goes, what? Wait, you went fishing? You know, that's part of your research? Yeah, well, that's, that's the most effective way. So you can believe it. Um, and then we use electric fishing. This boat um, sends electrical charge and stuns the fish. And then when we got to the end, we had to use um, some toxicants that actually um, we were able to save most of the fish, but they, they immediately, it blocks their oxygen uptake and they come up to the surface really quickly and then we edit them up and revive as many as we could and move them. So, what happened? So, we, in Tuesday Lake, we removed the minnows, added the bass, the lake cleared up. We went from a green lake to a clear lake. Peter Lake, we removed the bass and added the minnows and it ballooned. And these two lakes were exactly the same before. So just by changing the food chain, getting rid of the bass, adding the minerals, we changed the, the water chemistry and turned the lake green. Over what time frame? Over the course of the first year. Yep. Yep. I had a graph that actually showed that answered answer that question. I just took it out. So conclusion, changing the fish community changed each trophic level, so each level in the food chain, and the lake water quality. And that, that's the paper that we published afterwards. Alright, so that's one fish story. Lake Ontario. So this has been called by people way smarter than me, an accidental experiment. Uh, lake Ontario has been the, the subject of numerous accidental invasions and intentional stockings of fish and things come in and out. Um, because there's a shipping channel through, a lot of things came over from Europe in the holds of ship, ships, you know, where they'd have ballast water that they take on over in Europe, they bring it across, and then they dump the ballast water in the Ontario and surprise we have all kinds of fish and, and critters that, that aren't supposed to be here. And um, so that happened over, over many, many years. When they opened up the ship canal, a lot of fish species that couldn't get up through the rapids and over the falls and everything, um, prior to, to the shipping canal, all of a sudden could. And the Erie Canal was another place where they got up. And so things like sea lamprey got up. Um, which are these guys, lamprey eel. They're actually a fish, they're very primitive fish. And they decimated the lake trout population, which was native there. So these big predators were decimated. I mean, just nearly wiped out the Lake Ontario. Through the, the um, canal and through the, the St. Lawrence Seaway, these ocean-going alewife got in and just took off in incredible numbers. And this is the, the scene at the beach from where I was a kid. Just rafts and rafts of dead alewife on the shore, on all the beaches, and the water was just pea green. Because the elk, these alewife, you know, when they were out in the water, they ate all the zooplankton. So there weren't any zooplankton, so the zooplankton couldn't eat the algae. Mm -hmm. So the algae grew. So you get algae and fish. And so many fish that they died in great, great numbers. So, what did the, you know, what was the management thing? We had to get the perfect predator. Let's get something to eat these alewives. So what are we going to put in there, you know? And, uh, so, there was a lot, a lot of uh, searching far and wide. And so they decided to put in brown trout from Europe, Chinook salmon from the Pacific, um, coho salmon from the Pacific, and rainbow trout from the Pacific. So you're trying to control a species that's not supposed to be there with a whole bunch of other species that aren't supposed to be there. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know? How could that not be how could that not be stable? And you know, that makes perfect sense. So, a couple things happened along the way. So, you know, again, this, this is the total phosphorus, how many nutrients were in, you know, in the water column um, when I was a kid. And it was a lot. 
And that, that's what made it so green. Well, around that time is when phosphorus was banned in laundry detergents. Um, and so that's part of this drop off in phosphorus is probably due to that. And they also started stocking fish. So a lot of the phosphorus got tied up in fish rather than in algae um, once they started stocking fish. The alewife population went from these really high numbers down to almost zero in a couple of years. And when that happened, people were complaining that there weren't enough alewives for the salmon and trout to eat. Because along the way, they created a multi-billion dollar fishery. You know, all of a sudden people could catch these monstrous trout and salmon that were eating the alewives, but they were only put in there, remember, to get to keep the alewives off the beach, just to get rid of them. And people started catching them and were like, wow, isn't this something? You know, and uh, so that became got a life of its own. And so this is kind of the way that the management happened. So you, if a few are good, more are better, right? You know, we put in, you know, a million, a million salmon and trout, two million must be better. Well, they put in so many, they collapsed the alewife's stock. So all of a sudden, we got all these trout and salmon in there, and there's nothing for them to eat. And they started eating native species where they could, but they weren't as big as they used to be. And people have a very, you know, astute memory. Well, last year I was catching these fish, they were 30 pounds. Now they're only 20. That's not good. I don't like that. We need to stock some more alewives. And this is over a matter of, you know, 15 years, how quickly we forget what it was like to have a lot of alewives. So the, the stocking was reduced, and honestly, that was like, you know, the, the, the public meetings for reducing the stocking when I was a kid were just, they were just unbelievable. And actually, a lot of that happened when I was, you know, from the later parts of high school through college and right afterwards. I mean, it was just, people were livid that they were going to reduce the stocking. Just, Insane, you know, because a lot of people were making their living chartering, taking people out of charters and things like that. So then the stocking increased again because of all this political pressure, from the, you know, fishing and so forth. And then the water cleared up, so it went from green to to pretty clear. And part of that is because phosphorus was reduced. Part of it was food chain effects, and part of it was zebra mussels, which came in from Europe. And the zebra mussels are like little filters, and they filtered a ton of algae out of the water and cleared the lake up. Um, since then, there have been more invaders. There's um, uh, round gobies from Europe that showed up. Um, there's a bunch of other species. There's spiny water fleas, so there's zooplankton that, that little fish can't eat. They've got a really long spine on them. There's a whole bunch of new invaders since then, so the story continues on. But most of the management now is for the sport fishery, not necessarily to control whale life. So the whole, the whole story has been kind of flipped on its head. It was originally to get rid of the whale wives, now it's to maintain a sport fishery. Craziness. And all based on non native species, which is also crazy. But. So, Lake Waco, and this is, a, this is a lake that I worked on out in Texas. Um, Lake Waco is the, it's, it's the water supply for the city of Waco, Texas. It's a big city. Um, so it's their only water supply. It's pretty dry down there. Um, the most important thing about Waco, Texas, in, the, in terms of their water supply, is this number. 68,000 dairy cows in the watershed. Now that's a lot of fertilizer. And no surprise, that lake is pretty green. There's a lot of, and there's cyanobacteria, you know, the green algae, the, the the toxic variety. Um, they taste, the water tastes bad. Um, it's really expensive to try to treat for that. Um, we put together a watershed management plan, but to try to get 68,000 dairy cows out of the watershed is a really tall order. And it was going to take a long time to get practice to change and move dairy cows and things like that. And you're never going to get all the way there. So, as an interim solution, um, we suggested they try bio-manipulation. Let's change the food chain and see if we can have less help. So again, the same figure again, but this time we're using different species. These are gizzard shad and aren't native down there, but they're in there in great numbers. And these are evelazoplankton, which is turning the, turning the lake green. So our thought was to add these hybrid um, 
what they call wipers. They're striped bass, white, white bass hybrids. Um, and see if we can knock down this population, which would rebound the zooplankton, which would reduce the amount of algae. So we added these wipers, um, hybrid white, brat, white bass, striped bass. Um, you know, it's not a substitute for nu nutrient controls, but it changes the, the, the immediate picture there. Uh, and it's helping with some of the symptoms. So they were stocked in 2009. Um, they've done a lot of progress on dairy waste, and there was a drought as well. Um, and so the drought means that all these dairy cows up in the watershed, you know, the, the stuff isn't washing down in the lake as rapidly. So there's a reduction in nutrient loading as well, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, but the water quality is improved. Um, you know, as that joke says, uh, you know, being awake going all his life, Chris knew something must have gone wrong with the water treatment plant. He goes, whoa, what's wrong? I can see straight through the water today. Um, they had pretty poor water. So the side effects is there's big fish. You know, people can go out fishing and catch these big straight bass, white bass hybrids. Okay, a couple more slides and then we can do some questions. So, um, is water quality linked to fish in New Hampshire? The short answer is, I'm sure it is. The long answer is, we don't know exactly how because nobody's looking at it in any great detail. Uh, so who looks at these things in New Hampshire? Um, you know, the, the, the piscivorous fish, fishing game, does a pretty good job of keeping an eye on those. They know how, you know, they, they stock the trout and so forth. Um, they have some idea where the good, good bass fishing is and things like that. Um, they occasionally look at, in a few lakes, they'll look at the little fish. They do surveys, hydroacoustic surveys, where they send sound beams in the lake to, to look at, look for schools of, of the small fish, like in Lake Nipisaki, and, and I think maybe they do it in Swan as well, to see how many of the little fish are around, and most of those are smelt. Um, in the middle, you know, we have zooplankton. Nobody's really looking at that. A few, few people in maybe at UNH might look at it a lake or two, but nobody really looks at that. Algae, what kinds of species do we have? DES looks at a few lakes, UNH looks at a few. Um, you know, now that we have this Bloom Watch and Cyano monitoring uh, programs, there's more and more people, citizens, that are actually getting trained to do that. I know you guys have that building here. Um, we have it in Wolfboro now, uh, so that, that's picking up a little bit, and mostly by volunteers. Um, phosphorus, there are a lot of people are looking at phosphorus. I mean, we, we have pretty good data on phosphorus across the state. So, other programs going on at, at UNH, from the state, Dartmouth, they're looking at cyanobacteria, what causes it, what makes it bloom, they're looking at doing some sediment work, um, ecologically sensitive shorefront development, they're doing some of that work at UNH. Stormwater runoff, they're doing a lot of work with that at UNH. Um, remote sensing, uh, that's like looking at things from space, trying to look at water quality from space. Um, geographic information systems mapping, things like that. That's all being done at UNH as well. Um, so there's still a bunch of activities that may have implications for fish and water quality. And this is just a you know, long laundry list of things that came off the top of my head, really, uh, that could have influence on water quality beyond just sort of nutrients. Uh, you know, invasive species, nutrient plant, nuisance plant control, uh, you know, the activities that we do, you know, due to, to control plants. Um, nutrient enrichment, um, development, land exchange, drawdown, you know, we, we draw lakes down, we bring them back up, that could have an influence on fish and water quality. Fishing, stocking, mercury, other pollutants, climate change, all can have an influence on both fish and water quality. Um, and then, you know, on the positive side, you know, the education, the research, the volunteer efforts are all helping on the positive side to help us understand this a little bit better. So what does it all mean? We need to continue to focus on nutrient control through planning and prevention. And there isn't a single way you know, that I can think of, and I certainly there are not one, there is not one in the AWWA where more phosphorus added to the lake is going to make the lake better. It's just there just isn't. And that's true pretty much across the state. You know, there's there's just no place where phosphorus is, you know, more phosphorus is going to make the situation better. 
Um, fish, fish community is changing constantly, both intentionally and unintentionally, and we need to understand what that means. Um, biology, biology plays an important role. It may help explain what's happening with water quality in some lakes. There's some lakes where, you know, you, you don't have a lot of phosphorus, but yet you have algal blooms, and you don't know why. It just doesn't make sense. You know, you're like, why is this happening like this? And biology might be part of the answer to that. It may be that the food, the, the whole food chain is a little bit out of balance. Um, it may not, but it's something to look at, and uh, it's something we should look at. Um, so we should look at the entire ecosystem when trying to understand or manage lake conditions. And with that, well, wow, three minutes over, that's pretty good for me. Um, questions? I mean, I understand that having crystal clear water is not a good thing. Having, you know, absolutely pristine, no nutrient water like you would have in a swimming pool is not a good thing. A small amount of nutrients will support a healthy fish community. But you gotta have some. I mean you can't have none. So you can't have distilled water, just like you couldn't pour distilled water in your fish tank and add no food and to expect the fish to live. You gotta have some. I mean it's it's a food chain. Um, but you don't want it too much. You know, if you were managing a lake strictly, strictly for fishing and no other uses, somewhere in the middle range like maybe a mesotrophic lake, might produce the most fish. Um, down south, they often will, will manage for that because nobody would swim in those lakes, or many of those lakes. So they manage them for fish. Um, but I can only think of a few lakes where nutrients are so low that they believe that it's really got an influence on fish. And a lot of those are on the west coast. And historically, the nutrient sources to those lakes were returning salmon and that would run up into these lakes, spawn and then die, and the, the rotting carcasses would provide the nutrients that would support the food chain. Well, as those runs have decreased, the amount of nutrients getting to these, these pristine, high altitude lakes is pretty small, to the point that they can't support a lot of a lot of life. And there's been thoughts of actually fertilizing them. But those are at levels that are way lower than any of the ones that we have. So a little bit of nutrients goes a long ways, um, but the absolute lack of nutrients is not going to go rich. Seems like you used to hear about acid rain sort of killing the lake where you have. Yeah. You talk about Russell Pond. But... Yeah. So so acid rain, um, the, the pH situation in our lakes has gotten better. Um, since a lot of the, the worst of it back when we, acid rain was a big thing, um, which was sort of at the head, head of the news. Um, we don't have, we got, you know, um, scrubbers on a lot of power plants, um, and, you know, the worst of the emissions um, from power plants at least have been cleaned up, and car emissions have been cleaned up a little bit. So things are not as dire as they were. I mean, it's not a complete set success story. There's still acid stress, especially at high altitude lakes, um, but um, not as bad as it was. It's bad. Um, it it's going to take a long time because as these lakes acidify, a lot of the, the capacity to absorb that acid in the watershed was stripped out as well. As the rain fell in the watershed, it stripped out a lot of that resiliency. Yeah. On the <laughs> Better. Does extreme weather have a role in fish population? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, floods and, you know, if they come at the wrong time, it droughts, um, you know, during spawning times, changes in water level. Um, big changes in water temperature have a big influence on, on spawning success. You know, if you have a warm period early in the season, a lot of fish species would be triggered, you know, it's like, alright, time to spawn, and if that's, if, that, if that's just followed by, you know, three weeks of extreme cold and the water temperatures drop, chances are that spawning is not going to be successful. Um, so, you know, those kinds of, of weather extremes can have a pretty substantial effect on, on, you know, fish populations. 
Yeah? I'm pretty, maybe, maybe pretty naive about this, but I spent a lot of time in the Pittsburgh area in New Hampshire. Um, Wait, which area? Pittsburgh area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So are those lakes that, like four communities at Lake? Or yeah. Would those lakes be the ones that contain more um, native fish? Um, sometimes. They're, they're remote. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking, yeah so, so they're remote, but they're all, uh, most of them are dammed up parts of the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. So there's a dam at the outlet. So they were originally a river. Um, and they're dammed up parts of the outlet. Those are all for the most part, stocked, but there is a lot of native production of things like salmon up there. Um, they're close, probably closer to native um, than you know a lot of other lakes. You know, I know over in Maine, they still have a lot of lakes that have closer to an intact um, fish community, and one of the big differences is they don't have bass. And there's a big you know fight to keep bass out of trout ponds. And they got was was a, a really good apparently brook trout fishery. Um, until maybe 15 or 20 years ago when bass were introduced. They're moving up the Rapid River um, now, um, and it's changed the, the fishery up there. I mean, it was a native, native brook trout fishery. So, um, but Pittsburgh, you know, it's fairly remote, but it's still heavily, it, it's still managed. Um, um, you know, especially, I mean, probably the lakes that are not connected to the Directly, um, maybe closer to to sort of that that historic native fish community. There aren't many that are completely native. More questions? I mean, feel free to contact me. You, you, you know, it, it, what I'm always happens at these things is somebody will be driving away. Like, oh, I wish I could ask for that. You know, and uh, if if you don't have a pen, you can't write down my my contact information. Linda, Linda knows how to get hold of me. Fire away. If I don't know the answer, I'll try to find it out. I'll try not to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a movement about that lead, the uh, fishing in the community lead, the secret. Yep. Like that. So, what, what impact is that? Uh, yeah, so not as much on the fish, it's more on the, on the birds. Um, and uh, the bird, I mean, it can be incredibly toxic to loons and, and ducks and waterfowl. And it looks to them like a piece of gravel when they pick it up. Or they eat the fish that has the lead sinker or jig stuck in them, and you know, and it's up in the bird, and uh, not not good. I mean, you know, I think they're pretty much banned now, and uh, but you know, people still have them in their tackle boxes. You know, I, I mean, I don't use them anymore, but I guarantee somewhere in my closet of tackle, there's some box that has some, you know, from my dad or my grandpa that's got some lead in it. And, I've never used it, but uh, um, it's up to all of us to just kind of weed through our stuff to make sure that, that we don't have it anymore. Because there's good substitutes now. It's not quite as heavy as lead, but, uh, but it works. And you can feel better about actually biting on it to close it up when you bring your pliers <laughs> than biting on lead, which isn't so good. Any other questions? Sunny day. If I, if I come back, I'm 